Happy Thursday, everybody. I'm Jade Scott. This is Growth RX, and today we are joined with Brendan Mowat, all the way from Adelaide, Australia. How are you, Brendan? I'm good, Jade. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining. I, look, I've I've had the pleasure of knowing you for some time and watching your journey. So I'm really excited to be able to introduce you to the Growth RX community and have them see your passion for research and just anything in a clinical setting, basically, when it comes to pain and all that sort of stuff. But more importantly, we would like to get to know you a little bit more. You are an exercise physiologist. You're a business owner, the biomechanics, uh, the Knowledge Exchange, which is an online education platform, online courses and live face-to-face -face courses as well. You've just finished your master's and you're now about to transition across into a PhD. I think that's probably enough to start with. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm doing a few things at the moment, um, which will just kind of organically come from just being really interested in, in clinical practice. And obviously, as an exercise physiologist, I went on a bit of a journey, which I'll talk about a little bit in, in the presentation as well, because I think that probably gives some good context to why we're talking about unconscious biases and, and so on as well. But um, yeah, I just recently, sort of a couple of years back, decided I'd go into a, more of a research role and um, really engage in in the science behind what we do and why we do it and and uh, you know get amongst it and really start to try and understand a bit more about that which has been fun and exciting yeah cool thank you now a few hard-hitting questions uh, pineapple on pizza yeah hundred percent yeah anyone that, yeah anyone that tells you that that's not a thing psychopaths it's a it's proven science Psychopath. science okay I agree with you. I'm, I'm all over it. Pineapple on everything. Good. Pineapple on Parma as well. The Hawaiian yeah. Parma. Great. Ab absolutely. But mushroom on nothing. And that's, that's an important delineation oh, okay. we need to make early on. Yeah. Okay. Mushroom hater. Okay. Your favourite holiday destination? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, probably Japan. I've only been once, but it was probably the most fascinating cultural experience that I've, I've had, which is unreal. Yeah, I've never been to Japan. I'd love to go. Yeah. And do you share my love to hate Crocs? To what? For what? Sorry, my, you broke up a little bit. Hate, my love to hate Crocs, the footwear. <laughs> the footwear. Um, I, I would never buy them. And yes, I tend to judge people on whether or not they wear Crocs, especially Crocs with socks. That is something that, yeah, it's not appropriate yeah. in any point in time, not even around the home. Okay. Good, good. And in true growth or act style, I love to ask this question every single week. We get so many leading people, you know, in their industries every single week. I'm privileged to talk to them all. And the question that I love to ask is what is leadership or what does it mean to you? Well, good question. Um, I think it's probably providing the opportunity for, for others to kind of grow and move in a way that, that, they're inspired to that they're, they're excited about but giving them the opportunity to do that and the tools and the support in which they can grow into being their, their own people in whatever way they perceive that to be yeah absolutely just yeah guiding people through that journey is great so you've got a presentation organized for us today i'm really excited so everyone can sort of strap in and i'll hand over to you but you know we are talking about something that constantly does come up with there's a lot of biases that we have in a clinical setting but you're talking about unconscious biases in healthcare it's a, probably a, a topic that a lot of people wouldn't be all over but i think it's something that it really needs to be a point of discussion and probably talked about a lot more than what we do so I, I can't wait to hear what you have to say. I'll hand over to you and I'll stop talking. I, I'll join you at the end as I scribble away some questions to ask you afterwards. Excellent. No worries. Thanks. Thanks, Jade. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about offsetting unconscious biases in healthcare. We'll talk a little bit about what, what they are shortly. Um, but I'm going to talk about it in a couple of contexts in, in terms of the way that we, we, we talk and communicate with other fellow practitioners as well, um, whether that be online or in a face-to-face in -a -face situation, but also from our own clinical experiences and how that can be shaped by different unconscious biases and, and why what we might see and perceive to be our reality might not be that accurate. And, and just being aware of that, I think, can be really helpful. So we'll talk about some of the stuff that we can use to try and be more, more aware of our biases, 
but also to try and offset them so that we can kind of maybe update our own internal model of the world so we've got a more accurate depiction of what's really happening in our environment. Um, so a quick little overview is we'll talk a little bit about a perceptual theory on how we perceive the world and clinical practice. So we'll talk a little bit of the, the almost over, very much overly simplified neuroscience behind theories like predictive processing um, and, you know, how we come to create or formulate our uh, a perception of, 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 of the world and our, our, uh, our model, if you will. We'll talk about the unconscious biases that influence how we perceive the world. Considerations for discussions with other healthcare providers and patients. So how we can maybe think about where they're coming from perhaps and also from, from the patient and our clinical experience, why we may have seen some of the things that we've seen in practice and why the science actually may not align with what you've actually seen as well. So um, we'll talk a little bit about my story story in a second, but there's quite commonly the, the argument, it's like, I know the science doesn't say this is a fact, but I've seen this work in clinical practice. And so we'll talk about why that might be the case. And like I said, we'll talk about how we may be able to offset these biases and create the most accurate depiction of the world, or at least try and move towards that. And as you can see, there'll be probably no point where we have like a real perfect, clear picture that's accurate to the 100% hundred percent degree um, at any one point in time and so just a quick little bit about me and and my journey which I think kind of sets the background to why I find find this so so interesting and why I think it's also just so important because it has been such an integral and important part of my development and continues to be now and I think really shapes how I reflect and and how I continue to update my, my internal model of the world to kind of keep moving forward and realize and, and admit when you know, I was wrong or how I could be less wrong in the future as well. And so you can see in this little headline here where it says, Brendan saw it work, therefore science should catch up. It says the uncritical thinker. And when I first finished my master's of exercise physiology, I came out and felt like I'd missed out on all of these like magical skills. Um, that a lot of osteopaths, chiropractors, physiotherapists were getting, um, where it was, you know, the massage skills, the dry needling, the manipulation, all that kind of stuff. So I spent a lot of money and time going and investing in continuing education courses like a lot of, a lot of new grads tend to do, especially for a passion. I think it's a, you know, a thing that we tend to do. And I was just trying to find more and more tools that I could add my toolbox to, to you know to help that person you know that's in pain or um, dealing with some sort of injury and as I did that I did like my McKenzie credentialing and became a mulligan practitioner and I um, did my dry needling and massage and um, more corrective exercise techniques and all, all of this different stuff to see what, what would happen and, and virtually with all of those techniques as I went through I had people come in and they would get better rapidly in, in some cases. But then at other times, I'd have someone come in who presented very similarly to the last person, you know, might've been some low back pain and what I observed to be similar movement patterns and similar presentation. And I would end up doing something very, very similar to the last one that worked out really well. And then the outcome was completely different, a completely different experience. And I never really could makes sense of that but what I tend to, to do as I think a lot of us do is we kind of explain that away or perhaps it was their fault they weren't doing the exercises properly or what, whatever it might be that, that, that there were the kind of loopholes that I'd use cognitively so that I could be okay with myself and know that I was doing a good job and be really comfortable with that and so we're going to talk about some of the unconscious biases that really influence and affected how I saw what I did and why at some point in time I thought I had magical hands and why my exercise prescription was so magical and, and, and so much better than what the research that I'd kind of been exposed to or people would question me on said something just so different to what I was actually seeing in my practice. And so what is unconscious bias? It's a normal human prejudice about people, groups of people and essentially the nature of the world and, and how that is. All right. So we all have this. It is something that we're always going to have no matter what we have 
these unconscious biases that are happening without us even knowing, which makes it very hard to, to offset. Because unconsciously, like I said, and it's influenced by things like our past experiences, our culture and our beliefs. So things like where we come from, how we were brought up, everything that we've done up until this point right now is going to influence how we perceive the world to be. And essentially that's what's influencing our, our biases. And these may be mitigated by being aware of these different biases and reflecting on our behavior, our thoughts and our emotions in any given situation. And so it ends up being a big reflection process, but being really kind of aware of what biases are and finding different ways to reflect on, on deep levels to kind of see where we might have some flaws in our thinking, where other people might be coming from in their argument so that we can perhaps use that information in a meaningful way to help update our internal model of the world. But why is it a problem for healthcare? And when we're talking about the, the context of, of, of pain and musculoskeletal pain, which is what I primarily work with, but obviously this, this transcends across any, any different type of um, you know, clinical situation as well, or clinical interaction or human interaction, if you will. Um, but specifically to mask, years lived with disability is increasing. We know it's increasing and it's increasing faster than the growth of the population as well. And one in five people suffer with persistent pain. And so despite having more practitioners, better quality education, um, more research, more continuing education courses, all of these sorts of things were kind of trending in the wrong direction overall as well. So something's not working, but at the same time, um, and I'll talk about the super superiority illusion shortly as well. We all tend to a lot, at least that most of us um, tend to think the people we see are, are all getting better or, or, or moving in the right direction as well. So it comes back to us thinking a little bit more critically about what, measures we're using and why we might be seeing what we're seeing and all of that sort of stuff as well. So it becomes a little bit more complex. However, despite this evidence-based guideline care is not common. Um, and so we know that um, uh, allied health practitioners in, in this world where we're not always sitting within this realm of um, guideline evidence-based care. We identify as types of practitioners and time is spent at least for many. And I was one of these many at one point in time, I've kind of moved back away from it a little bit now, but debating with other practitioners about what type of practitioners are better and what types of modalities are better and for what. Um, and we, we often debate based on our own subjective experiences, the things that we've seen, the things that we've, we've experienced in the past. And that makes sense because we've had those experiences and it's not to say that these don't play a part and they're not important, especially, you know, with your clinical decision-making, but it's also saying they are limited as well. And so that's what we kind of kind of reflect on a little bit of why they're limited. Patient centered care is therefore hindered when we practice based on our practitioner identity or modality as well. And to kind of give you a bit of a, an example of this with myself as even an exercise physiologist, there's exercise in the name. And so if I'm practicing based on, I have to be prescribing exercise to every single person that I see, I'm gonna argue right away that not everyone needs exercise. And so if I am constantly practicing based on being an exercise physiologist and not someone that's just there to provide the best evidence-based person-centered support for someone, then it starts to, compromise that person-centeredness of what is going on. So it becomes pretty important that we, we start to detach our identity from our profession to be able to provide person-centered care. Now, it's not to say that having exercise physiologists and osteopaths and physiotherapists aren't important, they don't have a role and, and potentially slightly different scopes of what they can and can't do. But when we identify as that or as a type of modality practitioner, as I was once a McKenzie, McKenzie credentialed practitioner, as soon as we're just sticking within these things and these, these paradigms, it becomes more about the practitioner than it does about the person. 
And one other concept that kind of lays into the foundations of this idea of biases is the concept of naive realism. And it's the human tendency to believe that we see the world around us objectively and that people who disagree with us must be uninformed, irrational or biased. We've got the most accurate depiction of the world. They're all the ones that are screwed. All right. And, and that, 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 kind of a normal thing that we have however what you'll come to see hopefully by the end of um, today's talk is that where we are all biased where we, we all see the world subjectively and what we think that might be objective about our thoughts is, is not quite the case and I, I dug deep and went into the online forums of the, the flat earth society um, and I'm still getting um, Facebook marketing now because they think I'm really interested in flat earth merchandise and, and so on. So it's a bit, been a bit stressful. But at the same time, it was really interesting to deep dive into a lot of their posts and, and stuff that they were putting out there because they truly believe objectively that, that the world is flat. And then the way that they argue about it is the same way that we argue about certain ideas and thoughts in healthcare. I just thought it was so interesting. And this was one particular post where they're just kind of using their own reasoning to, to just show, you know, why they're so right. But at the same time, delineating them from the globe heads. And, and that's one of the common terms that, that we're called. If we believe in a, in a globe shaped world, they, uh, they, they call us the globe heads. So it ends up being this us and them kind of idea. It turns into this bit of tribal psychology. And there's a whole lot of research behind this, the psychology behind identifying as a group and belonging to a group and how that alters our behavior and the way that we, we behave as well. And so it's a really interesting thing that we all, we all have this tribal psychology. We all want to belong to certain groups and we all try and fit into those as best as we can. And so regardless of how partial you think you are, you are still going to be conforming and fitting into for different groups as well, um, whether or not you like it or not. And so to kind of go into some of the, the, the really simplified um, neuro cognitive uh, aspects of of you know our perception, and I won't spend too much time on this, but hopefully it just gives you this brief idea of why some of these things are happening. Um, and, and this comes from the predictive processing um, model on the work. If you if you want to kind of look into it a little bit further, it's a very interesting area, and it's one of our strongest theories. Um, at the moment about perception and perceptual sciences. And so obviously we've got this brain, this incredible organ, and it takes about 20% of our total metabolic energy. So a huge amount of metabolic cost just to do what it does. And we know that does lots of incredible, incredible things. Now, if every time you walked into a, into a room or had, a, had an experience, it had to recreate through all these neuronal connections create that experience in real time every time it, it would just be so inefficient the metabolic cost would be astronomical and so the theory posits that we are predicting based on all of our previous experiences and knowledge ahead of time what this what this incoming sensory information is and so when we have some light frequencies hitting our retina we're predicting what that information is before we actually have that experience, all right? And, and to give you a bit of an example, I'm gonna show you this, this, this little image here of a glass of lemon juice sitting next to some lemon. And I want you to think about picking up that glass of, of lemon juice and you're gonna, you're gonna put it up to your lips and you're gonna to start to tip it back and you're gonna let that, that yellow lemony liquid start to roll around in your mouth. And what you might, start to experience just thinking about that process right now is that you might get some of that puckering up going on maybe you feel a little bit sweaty maybe you get a bit of a weird sensation in your mouth and so and, and quite often people report actually tasting a, a lemon sensation straight away and that's without the experience even happening and so 
based on all, all your previous experiences of drinking a liquid that's sitting next to some lemons, you are able to predict. You're basically doing everything to create that experience before it's even happened. And so it only has to make some little changes in, in, in the signal depending on whether or not it matches what you predicted to be occurring or it doesn't match what you predicted to be occurring. And so if it doesn't match, so let's say, for example, actually you put it up to your mouth and you put it in and it turns out to be apple juice. It's a completely different makeup of, of chemicals. Um, and, and so your prediction is wrong to what the experience was. And so what we tend to see is that we've got to now update our internal model. So all of our previous experiences are now updated. And now the probability of next time you go to have a glass of lemon juice or yellow liquid sitting next to a bunch of lemons, the likelihood that it's lemon juice is just a little lower than it was before. You're like, oh, but it could be apple juice or it could be something else as well. And so it just starts to change how you shape your internal model. And so we'd call that a learning process. All right, You've updated your internal model based on new information that's come in. And so let's look at this just in a slightly different way as well. And so once again, we've got this internal model. So what we also call our priors, our prior experiences, knowledge and belief, everything that's happened before here shapes that internal model. And we're going to make a prediction about this incoming sensor information that's going to come in. And this is where our biases come in. Okay, so this is all of our unconscious biases. So our cultural our beliefs, all of these different things, every other interaction we've had with another healthcare um, provider, every research article we've read, any Facebook medium that we've, we've spoken about or, or, or seen come, comes in and starts to shape this prediction unconsciously. And so we're predicting what this sensory information is, and then that's going to be compared together. All right. Is it what I predicted? And now, if there's a match like the lemon juice experience, then the model is strengthened. So your internal model becomes stronger to go, oh, it's always lemon juice. It's that, and it becomes a stronger, stronger prior. Now, if there's a mismatch, then there's a prediction error. And what we hope to see is that the model updates. And so we start to change the, the probability of something actually being true. And we just start to soften and we start to... Uh, have that allow us to formulate and change what's going on. And so it can um, change our unconscious biases to some extent. Now, if that sounds kind of a bit confusing and whatnot, don't worry. We're, we're kind of simplifying something that is, that is highly complex. But the idea is that we are predicting. So everything that's happened before today is shaping the way in which you see the world. And this can be updated all right through a learning experience and that's what's really important is that we can shape the way that we see the world and our reality now an example of this that most of you have probably seen before is the dress that broke the internet and the question is what color dress do you see is it black and blue or is it gold and white now pascal wallach did um, some really interesting research on this phenomena because what we tend to see is half the population sees a black and blue dress while the other half sees a gold and white dress. And I see a gold and white dress and unfortunately I'm incorrect. This is actually a black and blue dress. And so what Pascal Wallach et al wanted to find out were what were the variables that could predict whether or not you'd see black and blue or gold and white. And the strongest variable that they could find was from 13,000 people was whether or not they were more of a, a morning person, someone that was exposed to more natural light in their previous experience, or if they were more of an evening person where they'd maybe been exposed to more blue lights and unnatural lights in their previous experience. So something that's shaping the way in which they would predict what this image is. And so that context of I'm predicting that here is more of a, a natural morning light going on. And so I see a gold and white dress. Whereas someone who predicts based on, oh, that's more likely to be unnatural lights lighting up this dress, are more likely to see a black and blue dress. And so it's coming from an unconscious level based on our previous experiences. 
Now, you might be one of those outliers that so you're like, oh, no, I'm an evening person and I'm seeing the gold and white, which is opposite to what they predict. But they're kind of just suggesting that it is these previous experiences that seem to be shaping how we, we, we start to take in this incoming sensory information. And we could have all agreed just then that it was the same light frequency is hitting our retinas, but we perceive it to be completely different. And if you can think about that when you're talking about your clinical interactions and when you're working with a, a client when you know they're you know they're seemingly maybe looking to get better or you know whatnot, that someone else might be perceiving something completely different as well. Or when you're having an argument with a fellow colleague that the way in which they're coming from is going to be shaped by their previous experiences and knowledge. And so are you. And so we have kind of need to be aware that we can perceive or have this exact same experience, but perceive it completely differently as well. So just being aware of that to begin with, I think can be really helpful. But I'm just gonna play a bit of audio right now. And I'm just gonna just show you in, in, in the way in which we can update this internal model of the world as well. Right, so I'm gonna play this little audio clip and Jay, just let me know if you can't hear it. Hopefully it, it works fine. But I want you to just hear and, and see if you can hear any any words or messages in, in what in what occurs. <laughs> yeah, Jade, could you could you hear? Yeah, any cool. sounds like the aliens it? were arriving. Yeah, cool. Could you hear any words in that or anything? Mm, you, no, I couldn't hear I, any I, words. I'll, I'll play it one more time for you. Okay. <laughs> Nothing? Um, I think I've watched too much Teletubbies with my kids. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> um, I think there could be words in there. Yeah. All right. All right. Now I'm going to play the same thing, just, just slightly different. The Constitution Center is at the next stop. The Constitution Center is at the next stop. All right. So now I've given you a new bit of information to hopefully update your internal model. And then I'm gonna go back to the first one and just have a listen. <laughs> and so what you might find now is that when you hear the inaudible version, you start to hear the actual words. The Constitution Center is at the next stop. The Constitution Center is at the next stop. All right, and so something that was inaudible, completely undecipherable as a bit of information, now has meaning because you do have information now within your internal model to, to use that information appropriately and accurately as well. And so that's one way this, this, this system sort of ups, updates the, the information. And so I want to talk about some of these biases now that kind of really influence these systems and how we can ensure that we are updating our internal model to be moving in the right direction towards a more accurate depiction of the world and our reality. So, and coming back to this idea, but the people I see tend to get better. And that was, you know, an argument I, I strongly used a lot for a lot of time. So some of the, the biases that really influenced that, that, that made it aware of me of how kind of I was being deluded to some extent or, or led astray. So one is illusory superiority. And this is the idea that we are better than the average. And there's been some research back in the early 80s, where 93% of US drivers think they are less risky and more safe or, or, or more apt than the median, all right? And so we know from a statistical point of view, that's completely impossible. So everyone just thought they were fantastic other than 7% who just thought they were shit ass. Um, but, the, but the majority thought they were better. And then we have some sort of preliminary data that suggests that we, we see this in healthcare as well. Once we've had a few years of experience, we start to overestimate where we kind of sit in the pool of other practitioners. However, if you're a new grad or, or even still studying, what we actually tend to see, and there's a little bit of data on this, that we under, under um, estimate our skill set as well. So we kind of have this lack of uh, confidence, if you will, However, this can change into an overconfidence as well. And so I can definitely re reflect on times where I was feeling very overconfident potentially with, with my practice and how I went about it. Another thing that happens in clinical practice is attrition bias. And it's the idea that those who do not do well do not return. So we're not necessarily aware of it. They just don't book another session or they go somewhere else 
or they say something really nice to you like, oh yeah, I, th I think I'm doing a little bit better. Oh, I'll let you know, you know, when I'm going to see you again as well. And so we tend not to have as much follow-up data or be exposed to um, the people who aren't doing well from our treatments and people are polite. They're probably not going to often tell us that, that we're not, not helping them in a, in a useful way. Confirmation bias. So this is the idea that we see and remember those who sing our praises and they do well. We seek information as human beings um, or, or try and find evidence that confirms what we already believe in and we try and reject things that don't. And we'll talk about the backfire effect in, in, in a moment as well. But we're always trying to confirm what we already know. So we've already got this bias where we have our internal model. We want to keep that and maintain that as it is already, just as a bit of a natural instinct. And so being able to kind of kick that away becomes really important. It's like, how do we actually stop that from happening so that we can have these learning experiences that we spoke about, where we can have some of this mismatch in our predictions so that we can update our internal model. The section I wanna talk about is called post hoc fallacy. And it's the idea, um, or, or it, it, the Latin terminology for it is post hoc erga propter hoc fallacy. And it's Latin for after this, therefore because of this. And it's the idea that if, let's say, treatment A happened before outcome of B, then A caused B. So it's this kind of causative thinking that whatever happened first has caused whatever happens after it. And I'm just going to give you a quick example um, that, that Donald Trump was, um, you know, nice enough to, to, to give us. They kind of talks to, to this idea. Two years old, two and a half years old, the ch beautiful child went to have the vaccine and came back and a week later got a tremendous fever, got very, very sick, now is autistic. I only say it's not, I'm in favor of vaccines. Do them over a longer period of time, same amount. So we've got this reasoning of this child having a vaccine and then, so A, happened, and then a week later, B, diagnosed with autism. All right? So it's this kind of causative thinking behind what's going on. And this is where science becomes really important because it can start to tease out what are some of the other things that might be having an effect on what's going on that she may have just, been autistic beforehand and that she just hadn't had appropriate screening. Maybe other things that occurred during that period of time that resulted in that diagnosis. If we think about our clinical practice, if I uh, massage someone's lower back that had a six out of 10 pain beforehand, and in my head, I'm going, oh, they're, they're overactive through you know these erectors and QL and they've got trigger points all through it. And so I'm going to give them a bit of a massage through here and they get up and they're like, oh, I'm a, I'm a two out of 10. I feel so much better. Thank you for doing that. If we kind of rationalize that it must have been because of the, the trigger points and because they were overactive uh, muscles, then we, we're missing a lot of the other things that might be happening. And, and so we, we know there's lots of science around the effect of just touch alone or human interaction all of the other non-specific effects that occur when we're visiting a practitioner and someone that's confident that we're comfortable with. There's just thousands and thousands of different things, including like regression to the mean, placebos, and so on, that influence what that outcome is. And that's where it kind of becomes important to start to engage with science, to sort of tease apart our narratives and go, what actually are the common things that we can pick up from that interaction to another interaction where someone feels better, where we didn't use the massage or use a corrective exercise prescription or whatever it is that we're using, that we might be able to kind of go, oh, th those things may seem to be more important. And that might be the reason why these people were starting to feel better. So how do I layer that into my, my interactions? And are there better ways of then doing it where there might be a specific effect or have some long-term implications in a positive way for this individual. So it's about just checking in on that reasoning and going, are we making this fallacy in our logic by, by having this post hoc reasoning? And so it's the same idea is, is it correlation or causation? And this comes from a really um, cool website, um, Tyler, I can't remember his last name off the top of my head, but spurious correlations. 
and where he takes huge data sets and does this kind of data mining to see what different um, random things actually correlate with other random um, variables. And here we've got one, and it's a real correlation that the per capita cheese consumption within the United States correlates with the number of people who died by becoming entangled in their bed sheets. And believe it or not, I've, I've cut off um, the axis on the right hand side there. But in, in 2008, 56 people died from getting tangled in their bed sheets. And so percentage wise, that's not very great. But at the same time, that blows my mind that people are getting tangled in their bed sheets and dying. But you can, you can rationalize that this is a correlation. This isn't a causative finding. This, this is just spurious in nature as well. So that's like a real easy one to kind of realize that that's the case. But when we come into clinical practice, it becomes a little bit harder because we've been told all of these different narratives in our, in our learnings and who we've been taught by and continuing education, it becomes a little bit harder to delineate between the two. And this is where science becomes really important. And here is one that I've made up myself and it was Brendan's corrective exercise prescription. So the quality of that and the more I learned about that correlated with the miraculous recoveries that wouldn't happen without me. And this isn't real data by any means, but in my mind, this is what I believe would happen. So every time that I kind of learned a little bit more of corrective exercise prescription, I started to attribute that to the reason why people were improving or getting better without being able to kind of really understand actually it may have been for many many other reasons that I could actually overlay in a different type of treatments approach for that individual that might have been more helpful for them because with the exercise prescription in such a specific way there may have been some harm some iatrogenic harms perhaps where they thought well I'm so out of alignment I'm you know I'm moving wrong I've, oh my god I can't even make this muscle work properly that may have completely changed the way that they perceive their body and then engaged in future exercise activity or when they experience pain again later down the track that ended up having an impact on 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 you know how they engage with healthcare utilization and many other factors so it becomes important that we focus in on that and so it's kind of coming back then to whenever we have a belief, just ask, is there causal evidence here to back it up? Or is it just a correlation or an observation? And that's okay. So we can definitely observe these things, but it becomes important that we kind of contextualize it because it influences our narrative. It's influenced our narrative that we provide to a patient, but it also is, is going to change how we maybe argue or discuss this with colleagues when we start to perhaps educate them, if we're a mentor or, um, if we're just trying to learn a little bit more about what's going on and what's really working in my clinical practice. So just a few other effects and biases that are influencing healthcare and, and there's, there's hundreds, there's a lot of these things and I'll give you a couple of resources in a second where you can kind of dive into these a little bit more, um, which I'd really encourage you to do because I think they are just important to be aware of and it's been very helpful and influential in, in me and my own reasoning. Um, but one is the backfire effect. And it is this idea that we reject an inf information that is conflicting to our, our pre-existing beliefs. And we often double down on our pre-existing beliefs. So like, I talk to you, and, you know, if, if, if that's kind of our identity in a way, it becomes very, very hard to update it. We don't really want to challenge that. And so we tend to push back and reject information that is different from ours as well. So being aware of that becomes really important. And I want you to consider for a second how this may be a stronger effect or our beliefs to our identity. And so if I'm an exercise physiologist and something comes along and tells me, hey, um, exercise is actually useless or harmful perhaps in this context, then if my internal model is me as an exercise physiologist, I'm probably going to feel attacked. I'm probably going to be wanting to push back because that's my livelihood. That's me as a human being. I don't want any, any part of that. And so being able to kind of change that, and I'll talk about kind of a way that I kind of conceptualize myself now in a second, that's different to being an exercise physiologist. Yes, that's my background. That's my training. Not refuting that, but how I view myself can be updated in a way that allows better updating of my internal model. And 
one more is the sunk cost fallacy. And it's the uh, behavior to kind of continue to hold a belief or a technique or a strategy due to the amount of time, the effort and the cost you've already invested in it as well. And so um, for me, you know, I, I spent a lot of time, you know, doing dry needling and doing my advanced dry needling qualifications. I spent money doing it and I saw it work, all of this, you know, trying to get really good at it. And in, in, in my, in my, um, and any time I read research that kind of refuted what I was doing, it, it felt like an attack. It was really kind of, you know, hammering at me in, in a bit of a personal way because I had invested so much time and money and effort in that. So I was like, how do I fit this into my practice or do I need to abandon it? And so being able to reflect on, on those sorts of things as well. And, and I'm not here right now saying there's right or wrong ways. Uh, what I'm trying to kind of get at is that we've all got this responsibility to be able to continually reflect on what we're doing and upskill in, in these areas about why our practice is working. So, I'm going to go through sort of nine things um, that I think can be really helpful in offsetting these unconscious biases and improving how we update our internal model of the world. So this first one is consider who you identify as. And so for me, my update or the way that I perceive it is that I identify as a person who wants to help others with the best most efficacious high value care possible so that that's kind of how i've now view what i do and when it is that that dictates my identity it becomes far less challenging to update my internal model of clinical practice and so alternatively if we continue to identify as a you know exercise physiologist in my, my circumstance or a modality, a McKenzie, McKenzie practitioner or an acupuncturist perhaps, we're already one step removed from that person-centered care. So once again, it's kind of creates a barrier between us being able to really listen to them and what's going on and really kind of supporting them in the way that's probably more helpful for them moving forward and, and getting them back to the things they want to be doing. In addition to actually listening to our colleagues and hearing what they have to say and being able to kind of start to challenge our own internal model with their own experiences and exposure to research and clinical practice and all of those other good things. So just imagine if your modality is challenged in a study, do you push back or do you update your internal model? And I think if I was an acupuncturist, and all of a sudden there was something that said acupuncture is not helpful for these things. And that person then came in to my practice, it becomes quite hard to kind of update my internal model. Whereas if it's about helping people with the best, most efficacious, high value care possible, it becomes really quite easy to do that. And some more. Two, acknowledge cognitive dissonance and question why you feel this. And so cognitive dissonance is possibly that, that visceral, very uncomfortable feeling you may have when you're, when you're faced with conflicting information, information you haven't heard before. It doesn't sit with your current belief system. We might have a bit of a sympathetic nervous system, a bit of fight or flight response. And this is, you know, a normal human experience to have. But if you do feel that, be aware of that and, and, and think, why am I feeling this? So think about why that might be the case. Then you can consider where did your belief come from and how reliable is your method of assessing its truth? All right. So a lot of the time we might've been taught something, but we've never questioned where it came from. And so when someone gives you conflicting information, it becomes really helpful to be able to go and go, all right, wait, hang on a second. Where does my information come from? All right. Now I'm really curious about where their information comes from. So we don't always have to update our internal model. We may already have a more accurate depiction of the world than, than the other person, perhaps. And so it only comes from a place of curiosity that we can find that out and determine whether or not that's, that's the case. Something else we could do is follow reputable people on social media that may have opposing views or they may question your ways of practice. So not, not so that you can like jump on and um troll them but more to try and understand what underpinning information uh results in that different perception so you know what is it that's forming 
the way they see the world and where's that coming from and have you missed something because that information might be really helpful for you to update that internal model but this is not going to be an easy thing to do unless you're doing these initial components here of that acknowledging of your cognitive dissonance and challenging your own beliefs and questioning where that comes from are you showing intellectual humility in other words consider you may be wrong and I think that's really, really important um, because once again, going back to um, that, that naive um, reality that we think we have where we think that we've got the most objective view of the world, it, it really works against this idea of just going to go, hey, hang on a second. I might be wrong. I really want to know more. Where are they coming from? So be curious. And I think that's probably one of the most important things um, that I, I find helpful. Do you hold this belief because, insert one of these fallacies, sunk cost or post hoc ergo propter hoc or group think or one of these other things. And this is where it becomes important to be aware of some of these biases so you can, you can see why you might think the things you do. And then just ask the question of like, what are some alternative narratives for my experiences so far? Why may I have seen someone get better in that context? Or what else might have been going on? that allows you to start to use other information that you may not have previously. And question, do we have greater scientific data that can better control for our biases? Now, what's important about that is science is definitely, you know, impacted by bias as well, by the researchers, by the methods of the research, all of that. However, for the most part, when we get good research, it controls for a lot of the factors that we won't get in our experience of N of one and so forth, where we've got that person sitting there in front of us. And so science is, is there to really help us and to help guide and make sense of what we do see in the clinical situation as well. It's not saying that we're wrong with what we've seen. It just means we need to use this information to try and help make sense of what it is that we do see. And so this last point here is really ultimately to, to engage a bit with science and to look at, you know, things like our uh, practice care guidelines. And this comes from a, a really nice paper. I'm not going to go through it, but if you're interested, it's, it's um, written by Ivan Lin, um, published in BJSM uh, in, in 2019. Um, and, it, and it talks about, you know, the, um, the 11 consistent guidelines from 44 global and national clinical practice guidelines in musculoskeletal care. Um, and, and I like to kind of reflect back on that in terms of my own clinical practice and go, does this actually, what I do in clinical practice, is it represented by this chart? Am I doing these things in the, in the kind of ratio? Am I fitting into this? And if not, why is that the case? And other other things and so you know being able to engage in this and lots of other sort of research can be really helpful in in making sense of what we're going on and checking our own biases and uh, and whatnot before um, sort of going to any questions or whatnot just some other further further reading that uh, I found very helpful in my own in, in my own um, learnings in, in the kind of critical thinking space and in, in terms of logic is these few books here and some of them have um, some podcasts as well um, also so thinking fast and slow by daniel kahneman is a great book um, one that's probably a little bit more fun is david mcraney's you are not so smart that's a really fun book to read and really quite enjoyable lots of really good stories in that and he's also got a, a podcast under the same not name you are not so smart um, and it's phenomenal it's really really interesting lots of social psychology stuff um, and, and, and some really cool stuff on tribal psychology and all of that some stuff that we've kind of alluded to very, very briefly um, in today's talk. Your Deceptive Mind, um, which is a really fantastic book as well on critical thinking and, 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 and the similar topics. Calling Bullshit, if you want a book that um, drops the word bullshit more than any other book in the world, that one is great. And it's a lot about data analysis and critical appraisal of research and statistics. And the last one there is testing treatments, which is a really cool one that goes into lots of stuff about overdiagnosis and over medicalization of a lot of conditions and offsetting some of these different different issues that we have in healthcare. Um, but that is from me, everything I've got. Um, but I'm happy to take questions, Jade. You know, talk about different things. Um, 
because as I said, um, it's a very big topic and we've kind of only just scratched the surface, but hopefully it's kind of got people, you know, interested in thinking about these things if they haven't already. Look, absolutely. I think I was just sitting there and I think from studying social and behavioural psychology for so many years, to be able to unpack it like you did in such a short period of time. I mean, we, we studied in clinical leadership in a, in a healthcare setting at Melbourne Uni. We took a whole day on biases and then we had, you know, hours and hours and hours of pre-reading. But what you did just then, I think for those people who don't have a, a contextual idea of, of how vast this topic is, you did an absolutely brilliant job. Um, and it left me with a lot of questions that I have to ask you. It's made me, my mind tick over a little bit. I can hear your passion when you talk about this stuff. And I think that's part of my passion to bring together a platform, much like you've done with the Knowledge Exchange and many others are doing now, is we are starting to de-identify healthcare. Physios now are learning from chiropractors and osteopaths from exercise physiologists. I mean, your course is endorsed by Osteopathy Australia and, and for good reason. And it's one of the things that I've been suggesting for a long time and many others that we always have someone doing something better than ourselves that we can learn from. And that means outside our scope. So I certainly agree with you on, on de-identifying a lot of what we've learned to remove those biases. But my question to you, in an ideal world, Brendan, do you think we should all merge together? Do you think that there could one day be a manual therapies course that supersedes all of them? And whether it be postgraduate or not, or from a university situation, I mean, I, I kind of know what your answer is, but I'd love to hear you answer it diplomatically. I, and, and, and I think that there's definitely, that there's skill sets that, that different professions have that may be suited to, to different people um, and, and, I th and I think that's important to recognize however there is a lot of crossover and I, and I think at the end of the day in my own thinking um, if a person is coming to seek help and they've, they've got obviously all of their you know contextual factors all of the things that are going on in their life that's impacting their symptoms they might have some tissue damage and going through these healing phases and so on if we're truly being person-centered why should we be doing something different and i think if there was a vast difference between what i did and a physiotherapist did and uh, maybe an osteopath did for a person um, you know, with, with, with back pain, then how could we all be, be person-centered? All right. So if, if, because it just means it's being dictated now by our, our profession. And now, yes, like I said, there are some things in our training that give us a little bit of scope that we can maybe use a bit of a tool to help them engage in whatever is meaningful to them. So there's that. However, if, if there was this kind of global training, um, education tertiary program that covered all of these different things that that sit within you know the, the the totality of the evidence then in a way i think it would allow us to free up the uh, our, ourselves from an identity where we're kind of competing with others in this kind of weird fictional sense to actually being able to just provide person sense care just listening what is going on what do they need support with what do they need help with and then helping guide from there i don't know why that would be so different from person to person unless we're not actually being truly person-centered in our approach yeah absolutely and yeah, imagine globally there was a course taught by some of the best leaders in their own industry that came together to make up their own there's an idea if anyone wants to jump on and join us we're starting up our own uni course um but yeah, I mean, yeah, it would, it would bring so many opinions and remove so many biases or it might internally create a new one. So, 100%. Um, and so my next question, I just want to take a step across. So we talked about practitioner bias and understanding all of those. There's so much value in just understanding the background behind these biases because often one of the things that we find when a patient comes in, a patient calls us and books an appointment in the first place because of their own internal bias because their parents have seen physios their whole life. You see the argument happening with this confirmation bias just within our own patient or client group. 
So, oh gosh, you know, oh, I would never, I would never see a chiropractor again, or, you know, gosh, my osteopath hurt me. One, one practitioner did the wrong thing. And suddenly we've got social proof amongst an entire profession. So my question to you, how do you deal with it as a practitioner? What would your advice be if you get to the end of a consultation that does happen often with manipulative therapies? You've got a patient who is hell bent on wanting their neck cracked. And as a practitioner, you know that they don't necessarily need it, but because of their own confirmation bias and also a sunk money, by the time they get to that, that sunk money bias, by the time they get to the end of the consult, they feel like their expectations aren't met and therefore they've undervalued that service. And there needs to be a whole lot of advice and communication as part of that. Don't get me wrong if you're going to suggest not doing a certain technique. But often we are bullied in to techniques by our patients. And, you know, how do you get around that? What's, what's your advice on that? Um, well, I, I, I may not even be the best person to answer that because I've got my own biases whereby I'm an exercise physiologist and so people actually come in with a bias who don't expect manual therapy. And I actually created a bit of an issue for myself at one point in time when I did was heavily based in, in, in using manual therapy as part of what was going on. And I found that I always had these hurdles that I had to jump over when I was starting to kind of change and evolve to kind of being a little bit more active in my approach and trying to get them to have a little bit more control of their progress forward. I found that really, really difficult and was running an, into, into that problem. And what I found, I guess, to really try and help shift that mindset was upskilling and spending more time learning about things like motivational interviewing and psychologically informed practice. So I could really get or, or become, uh, start to understand what drove these people. What was it they wanted to get back to? What did they believe was going on? And I think once I started to develop those skills, it, it became a lot easier to transition back into active Based therapies and being able to overlay education where there may be gaps that we could identify in their knowledge where maybe they believed pain equaled harm and we could rationalize from their, their, their clinical assessment that actually no you know pain was being maybe protective but it, you know that they were sore but safe and being able to give them that sort of information and, and the benefits to what's going on but really putting them in the driver's seat and getting them to reflect reflect on all right you've so we tried these few things before and, and you're still back here now would you be open to trying something a little bit different right now and i'm, I'm not giving anything specific here because i think that it, it has to be um specific to that individual sitting in front of us but but really motivational interviewing is a fantastic tool to be able to start to move away from something that you may not believe in um, you know, that you think that might not be helpful for that individual, that it may even be harmful. Now, if you kind of think whatever technique or whatever strategy you're doing doesn't have harm associated with it and it's whatever, then, hey, you know, you can make that, make that judgment as well. But if you actually truly think that's the case, then I think that's where we just need to listen better and develop our skills about really listening, about really giving them the control, but the control not to just make decisions based on what's happened in the past, but where they want to go in the future, what they want to do, where they want to be in an ideal world. And it is that really fine balance between wanting to give people the freedom to make their own choices, but also this paternalistic libertarianism, which sounds like a huge word, but in short, it means that science also suggests and studies suggest that people like direction. They do. So we have to find that perfect balance as practitioners between directing somebody in their care because of our experience and our education in that position where we've come from, but also giving them the freedom then to educate them enough to then make an educated choice. And also, I guess, you know, that, that liberty to be able to make a decision for themselves. So I think, you know, I've got so many notes here and I'm not even going to get through them all because we don't have any time left. But the last thing that I wanted to touch on, obviously, be curious. That comes up constantly. I think that notion of be curious is almost in fashion. If you've watched Ted Lasso, he also suggests be curious. There's the, the school of Ted Lasso, if you haven't watched, go ahead and do yourself a favour and watch that series on Apple TV. But I think engaging in the science, that came up constantly, just opening up our mind, but also that that cognitive dissonance that we feel if we get to a profession, we've spent five years studying it, 
We spend five years doing osteopathy. We get to the end and we think, oh, some things just aren't fitting. We've got a dissonance. That usually need, means that we need to change something. And if we don't change something, we're going to get more of what we're already doing. And so I think that just comes from education, different CPD, different learning and not having that fixed mindset. So this leads me to social media and social media influence, which I know is one of your favourite not topics. <laughs> this is happening in COVID, whether we like it or not. People are attached to our phones. This is not a place to find evidence-based medicine and science and some of the beautiful articles out there that take so long to actually go through to, to pull apart. What we're seeing is other people put to put forward quality content, free content on social media. There's a lot of people of influence doing it. And exactly as you said, and you gave the option of, you know, follow people that feed your cognitive bias, but also follow people that you disagree with just to open your mind up. What are you seeing at the moment on social media? Do you feel like it is dangerous or do you feel like all this content is great? How do people fleece through it all? Yeah, I, I, well, I think you're right. I think I completely agree what you've said there. There's just so much information. And yeah, it's, it's conflicting. There's so much conflicting information there as well. And I um, had, had um, a student not long ago say, you know, but that's kind of how science is, isn't it? Like there, there, there's always evidence for one opinion and there's always evidence for the other opinion. And I thought, wow, like that, that's not how science works. It's like, yes, we can find evidence for those sorts of things, but, but actually we're trying to really, you know, look at the totality of it for the population we're thinking of and, and that kind of thing is actually we're trying to get closer to an accurate depiction of reality. But I just thought from that comment of how confusing it must be to be in, in, in that environment and why so many people have disengaged from research and engaging with science and are more likely to... Likely to be influenced by just someone they think is credible online and what they see in their own clinical practice than they are from the actual um, literature. And so I think a big part of it is trying to improve our science literature, or lit literacy rather, science literacy. Um, and, and one of the things that we get back from quite a few people who have come to our courses is like, we'd, we'd love a course um on appraising literature and there are a couple of free ones out there and i can't remember there was one posted not too long ago about praising literature um and, and i think that's kind of important that we we learn to do that ourselves and don't rely on other people to do that for us because there's lots of people like me who who post something and i'll put like the abstract up there just so people know what it's about and then they can link and all i'm hoping is that they do engage with the thing but the thing is if we just eat, read the, the abstract then we miss out on all the context and whether or not there there are biases in the interpretation of the results and all these different things that that you're just not going to get so we need to be engaging ourselves and yes we don't have the time when we're clinicians doing 40 hour weeks to do that and so i think there's some there's some cool resources out there things like physio network um and, um, and and whatnot where uh, oh trust me physio trust me ed um, that and, and you know what you're doing that, that are translating lots of information and it still comes with interpretation and that kind of stuff so you might have to dig a little bit deeper but I think using those kinds of resources can be really helpful helpful ways to to mitigate that but otherwise yeah I can see why it'd be so confusing on social media and I think it is problematic and I think before we finish up, people are fundamentally trusting. And so when somebody of influence does deliver a message, most people like to first and foremost believe it. And that's why I think we get so crushed and people fall so hard when they're seen to be unauthentic or when they do something wrong. Social media is, is a, you know, even, even I don't like being on it. I said to you before we started today, I just, I never get used to this. But having conversations like this to me are so important to pull these things apart and to bring people together. And you've just done that so beautifully. So I, could, I could talk to you about this all day and I'll probably hang around. Likewise. Everyone else can go and we can um, hang out. But look, how can we, you, you've got a couple of courses that are extremely popular. Can you tell us about them uh, so that people can find you and, and dive into some of this stuff further with you? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so there's more information on our website, which is just tkex.org. Um, and they're all founded in sort of a biopsychosocial approach to healthcare and person-centered care. Um, so we've got one that's sort of specific around the lumbar spine and SIJ. So we talk about like the specific anatomy and biomechanics around different pathology and issues around that. But with, with, within a pain science framework as well. So kind of go through all of that. Um, one on very similar to that, but uh, on the, the shoulder and the cervical spine. And then we've got another one, which is just on biopsychosocial practice. So a little bit more about the person-centered communication using motivational interviewing where ACT and CBT kind of may fit into, into the mix in, in terms of used as tools, not to change someone's pain so much, but as to um, really kind of get all the pieces of the puzzle together and, and, and being able to work with them in a, in a very person-centered way to, to start moving forward and engaging back in life and the things they want to be doing. Awesome. So, well, yeah. well, we'll put all those links in the members area for people as well, so they'll be able to find you and connect with you when you are and have been a direct leader from the beginning. So thank you for being a part of this and my community and my vision. I'm so grateful to have you. Thanks very much, Brendan. No, thanks, Jade. I've loved being here. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks. Okay, bye.